I set about writing this book because um, over the years I've been lucky enough to meet with and travel to lots of amazing places and witness um, incredible men and women working in sustainable tourism. And some of these people win awards and some of them have become famous, but um, they're mostly presented as exceptions. They are the outliers and I don't see us designing an industry that uses them as the model upon which we base the way we move forward. We continue to base the industries, the mainstream industry, upon a slow, incremental approach to change. Yet the problems confronting not just the industry, but society at large, climate change, resource depletion, etc., are happening at a far greater scale than it is possible to respond to with an incremental nudge slowly to make a little bit less damage. Um, before working in tourism for several years, I worked in the environment sector. And during my time there, I came across a lot of theories and approaches that have a quite common currency in sustainability circles, the circular economy, biomimicry, rewilding. And yet I'm continually quite surprised that inside of tourism, these theories and approaches, and these aren't just totally niche approaches, these are approaches that are being used by businesses of the scale of IKEA and Unilever to rethink the way they do business, get very little talked about in tourism. And what I hope is that by bringing the approaches of the circular economy, of biomimicry, of rewilding, into the common, the major um, tourism discourse, and by looking at those few companies that I do see around that are really embodying, embodying them in their way of doing thing business and are generally designing their core purpose as being for good rather than seeing it as an add-on, then we might have the chance to build an industry that truly is transformative. People in the tourism industry often say that if only the tourists demanded it, we would supply it, and that we're just waiting for there to be a market for us to supply them with sustainable tourism. I think that's disingenuous on the whole. I don't think that it is for the tourists to call for something that an industry will then deliver when the industry is the one making the profit out of the business that is damaging communities or habitats. What I propose through my book that looks at how we might orient our industry to be one that is a positive impact, that is leaving an actively better legacy by the very way it operates, is that regardless of whether tourists call for what we do, simply the very fact of our operations will make the world a better place. This in itself, I think, will then bridge the gap between Tourists doubting our sincerity. They go to our hotels and look in our bathrooms and there is a little card there that says, help us save the planet, wash your towels once less. And people think, that doesn't seem very plausible because it's not plausible. Anyone who has witnessed what's been happening in the last summer knows we're not going to avert global climate crisis through washing our towels a bit less. So I think we need to, if we design an industry, a structure, a hotel, a travel company, where simply its existence means that the way it operates facilitates sustainable growth in communities, enables habitats to restore and to regenerate, aids the protection of wildlife, that will inspire people to want to be on those sort of holidays. They will get better holidays as a result because they will be more engaged with better experiences and with communities who are more receptive to their presence. And I think, therefore, we will end up solving the question of how do we get tourists on board? We get tourists on board by being better. I think we have to start from the principle that there are limits to growth because we live on a finite planet and we have finite resources and we are using them up. And unless we are using renewable resources, sun, wind, water, there is an end point. That end point, depending on how rapidly we use them, is what is a, you know, a varying distance away. But we have to start from a principle of capacity. If I run a theatre, my theatre has 200 seats in it. 
I don't talk about managing the number of people who will come to my theatre. I sell 200 tickets. I don't then fill the aisles up with more people but manage how they behave. So I think tourism has to start from a notion of what limits are and capacity is. And that has to come from the destinations themselves. If I am someone who is paying their taxes and living in Venice and my family's heritage is there, I should have a very significant voice in how many people I want to see on the streets that I'm spending my time and trying to do my daily business and going to the shops and buying food. There should be much more input from local people into deciding that than there currently is. The early versions of ecotourism were heavily criticised for excluding local people. It was the sort of model that simplified, you might say, rich bloke buys large area, turns it into park, puts fence around it, keeps local people out, fills it with wild animals, people fly in, have a look. And not surprisingly, that was heavily contested, and correctly so. Furthermore, because those people who were now excluded from what maybe had been their, you know, their historic lands, they saw no benefit from what was happening around, and thus they didn't view it favourably, and this created a resistance and potentially worse into conflict. Increasingly, that is less and less the case. Ecotourism as a phrase still gets criticised, but the core principles underlying it, and certainly responsible or sustainable ecotourism, is of a sustainably managed tourism in a natural area where the interests of the local community are looked out for. And in, you know, in the cases of, say, Southern Africa, which is experiencing some of the worst crises in terms of poaching, particularly of you know, species like rhino or lion or elephant tusks, uh, it is those communities where the local people are most involved in benefiting from the tourism, from the safaris, that are suffering least from the poaching because where, the, where, where poaching an animal will provide unimaginable financial wealth to one man from a village and thus the risk is worth taking. If the entire village thinks that it is more beneficial for them to keep those animals alive, it, it creates a regulatory system that means the community is invested in protecting its own natural resources. Tourism has you know, developed around the world over the past few decades at a you know, dizzying pace. And some countries that have more mature, developed tourism economies and infrastructures have naturally gained a greater experience of both the opportunities and the costs around it. Now, this knowledge, these, these experiences should be shared. So those who are coming into the industry should have the opportunity to learn from those who have gone ahead what to expect rather than simply to be presented with some glossy sort of you know poster image of how amazing tourism will be and how it will solve everything there needs to be an honest appraisal of what they potentially will be giving up what they potentially will gain tourism presents itself as a vast driver of economic benefit to, especially to less developed countries there was a line that was said by someone that is often used about it being the greatest transfer of wealth from richer to poorer countries. However, a large part of how the tourism industry is now operated is through global multinationals owned in countries far away from where we actually go on holiday. And there, it's, it's very hard to get the exact figures because these figures are not openly available, but it has been suggested that it's as high as 80% in some countries could be what's known as leakage, the amount of money that leaves the country and returns into the pockets of shareholders, into the host company back at the countries where it is actually its headquarters are based. So although they may see a significant investment, how much of that investment will actually be translate into money that is felt in the pockets of men and women on the ground will vary depending upon the form of tourism and so although the high profile big brand hotel get theme park opportunity may seem like the big opportunity it may well be that a more localized 
decentralized, diversified tourism economy actually presents a more sustainable, more resilient, and in the long term, better investment for local people.